Okay, uh, 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 let's YouTube. shut this. YouTube. Oh, yeah, yeah, YouTube, right, 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 right. Son of a bitch! You almost, you almost got me there. You almost fucked up. I almost did. Hey, look, someone's breakfast is right there. I'm gonna steal it. Eat yeah, 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 all the yeah. eggs. I'm Eat gonna steal bacon. it. I'm Andrew. You got to put this in the video because Eat this is just stuff. this is just great. It is some what, high the, quality uh, entertainment. This is how we get ready for the podcast: is we do okay. uh, weird songs. Somebody yeah. just opened the door. We got to close the door. Good job, Mozzie. Yeah. He's not a very good host. This dog, I promise. No, Mozzie, you've buddy, done it. Buddy, 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 buddy. Mozzie, go over there. You're get your fat ass over there. Okay, well, I'll just close the door. Oh, I shouldn't say that to him. He has body image issues. Yeah. He's a very cute dog, though. You have, you he have made a, him depressed. Yeah, he's actually solid as a rock. He is. He's actually he's solid. He's just a little baby with the uh, tandem uh, balls. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right. Tandem <laughs> balls. Tandem balls. Tandem balls. Oh, tandem balls, old mm. tandem balls. <laughs> uh, I forgot. How was I going to shorten this? Oh, yeah, the sales. We don't have a page. Oh, we don't have a page. I'll yeah. go through it real quick. All right, here we go. Here we go. Ready? Here we go. Yeah. All right. Hey, you just found Mind Pump. We're the best fitness podcast in the world. Oh, yeah, we do entertainment, too. Hey, check this out. We're going to give you a free MAPS Anabolic program. All you need to do is leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours, and we need to pick your comment. Make it a good one. If we pick your comment, you get access to the most effective workout program of all time. One more thing before we start the podcast, turn on your notifications, subscribe to this channel, and check out our monthly sale. We have MAPS Anabolic 50% off, and we have the Shredded Summer Bundle 50% off. You can find both of those at mapsfitnessproducts.com. You just got to use the code uh, April Special. All right, enjoy the podcast. Get in there, man. What are you mixing up there? He's going to go uh, rock star with Organifi Pure. Oh, dude. Yep. That's going to be an interesting combination. He might there. invent something during the podcast. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. <laughs> he might. Are you going to see the words come out of my mouth before I even say them? Hopefully. And, and I'll smell them too. And you'll, well, that's yeah. That's kind of a dig though, buddy. Ooh. Yeah. Dude, pure with caffeine is a wonderful combination. Yeah. It's, it's one a, of my favorites. It's a balanced and a hyper at the same time. It's like giving your car a driver. It's what? You know what I mean? <laughs> Otherwise, you just have a car. You got somebody to drive it. Wow. Yeah. It's already working. He hasn't even taken it yet. Deep. It's just, a that was a haiku. <laughs> just being near. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been uh, I've been talking about uh, Formula One so much on the show and stuff. Yeah. That I'm getting all kinds of like recommendations and DMs and stuff now. Do you, I didn't know. Um, I think it was in the forum. Somebody said this. Do you know how much uh, Lewis Hamilton, what his salary is, what he makes a year? I have no idea who that is. That's the, like the top driver right now so for Mercedes. So so salary, not endorsements, yeah, salary. Yeah, his, keep them, it's got to be like in the like a million. Take a guess. I have no idea. You have, Of course you don't. You you have a guess, a million? Yeah. 51 million. Wow. 51 million? A year. Are they the highest paid Ooh. athletes in the world? They must be. I didn't even know that. I well, didn't have. I didn't even know. Now it makes that, sense. That's per year. Yeah. Wow. Is that more than NASCAR? Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. So I, you know what? What <laughs> I, I, I mean, I I, it makes sense, right? I mean, it's probably one of the most expensive sports in the world. It's uh, there is literally only 20 seats available in the entire world. I so mean, it's just super limited, yeah. super exclusive. Yeah. So, but is I, it a wealthy? Uh, yes. spectator sport? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Not like wealthy, obviously the people driving and stuff. I'm not about those spectators. Like, is it expensive? Well, I've never seen the stats mm. on it. I've never been to one, so I don't know what it costs to, to get involved in it, but I, I think it attracts money. I mm. mean, when you look at like Monaco, Singapore, all these places they race. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it draws the yachts and yeah. the- and Ro Rolex will be in there sponsoring. Yeah, they are. Yeah. I mean, Rolex is all over the tracks and Hublot and like, all, I mean, all the big expensive I, I told brands. you guys about when I went to Monaco once, right? Were you there for that or no? No, no. We just went for a vacation. We were in staying in Nice, which is in uh, in France, and then we took the train to Monaco for a day or two, and it's the most uh, insane money place I've ever been to. Like it's almost cartoonish and ridiculous. Like taxis are top end AMG Mercedes. Uh, <laughs> I saw Lamborghini police cars. You know? Yeah, yeah, a, naturally. A, a fucking cop car. It's yeah. a Lamborghini. That's so sick. I'm like, holy <laughs> shit. Yeah. The casino, 
The How kids, many times do they just like you know make up some kind of chase just to just go uh, like as fast as possible? I, I, <laughs> hey, I guess yeah. you need a Lamborghini. Your tags were expired, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? If you think about, yeah. you, you probably need a Lamborghini if everyone else is driving Ferraris and Lamborghinis. Right. They try to escape. You ain't gonna catch them in your Cutlass. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You need a, a well, Lambo. You gotta go get that McLaren. Just, ah. They do just fine in the states. You can't outride. You can't outrun the radio. I know. Just get a helicopter. Yeah, yeah. They just know. got hella money. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but uh, I saw. Um, it's just the flex. So the casino there was insane. Like you go in this casino, and you have to first you have to pay to go in the casino. Really? Yeah. So you can't just walk in. And I think they do that for tourists or whatever. And I was watching people. By the way, this is back in. Uh, Ooh, I want to observe like really rich people spending money, dude. <laughs> Dude, it's like uh, it's like if you imagine if you saw someone yeah. with hundred dollar bills and they were just wiping their butt with it. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> this is what I use for toilet paper. Like, wow, this is how they live, bro. Like, I this is amazing. I, we go in there and I'm watching the people gamble and I see these you know these older men or whatever and they're just you know chips like stacks of them right betting them. So I'm like counting the chips. I'm like, wow, that's like a thousand dollars. That's like two thousand dollars. And then my friend, I was there with Jason, right? Mm -hmm. He goes, he hits me and he goes, bro, look at the minimum bet on the table. 5,000 euro was the minimum. Yeah, that's crazy. So these guys were betting 30, 40, 50,000 euro oh, yeah. a hand. See, that makes me sweat, dude. It'd just be like, oh, oh you bro. watch people just lose it all this was immediately. This was 2006. Yeah. This is also where I saw, like, uh, we went to one of the beaches there, and uh, I'd never seen sand so clean, and I know why. It's because they literally clean it. Mm. And there was, like, this boat that would go offshore and just kind of go back and forth. And the job of the boat is to clean the ocean <laughs> near wow. the near the beach. Oh, really? No, yes. No dude. bum heroin needed. No, bro. Like... You could drink the seawater. It was just so it was so clean, except wow. it was salty, right? But wow. But there was this guy. We were sitting down, you know, uh, on the beach, and it's just insane. And there's this like old, overweight, like olive complected dude, you know, laying down. He's got like a gold bunch of gold chains and he's just sitting there's a big <laughs> belly and he's in a speedo. Yeah. And so I'm like, you know, I'm telling Jason, like, dude, look at that yeah. guy. Like, this is hilarious. That's like and that's bro, like the guy that's behind every Instagram chick that, that's taking oh, pictures on the boat. Oh yeah. bro. He had he had three to four like supermodel girls sitting around him and they were like massaging him, putting stuff on <laughs> what him. What was the and, name what was the name yeah. of that app? What's it called? Sugar Babies? Yeah. Is that what it's called? Yeah, Sugar Babies? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? That I, I remember we were in LA and they were they were advertising it on a on a, a billboard. I know, I couldn't believe that. Do you remember that? I do. Yeah, I think it was Sugar Babies, right? Doug, do you remember? Yeah. That sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah. Don't act like you don't. He's like, yeah. Don't act like you don't. <laughs> like you don't. Subscribed. <laughs> don't like, yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> don't put me on blast. Let me see your, me see your phone, guy. Yeah. Huh? Doug, Doug's not a sugar, sugar daddy. Baby. He's a sugar baby. Speaking of rich guys, do you guys uh, do you follow? Do you know who Ty Lopez is? Uh, he's like he's the internet guy. Yeah, guy. Yeah, the internet guy with the the books inside of his garage with his Lambos there and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, known for making all kinds of money e commerce. Right. He kind of like fell off like or he just disappeared for a while like i used to follow him and, and pay attention to some of the stuff he was doing and i hadn't seen him on social in a while he popped up this morning in my feed and i got i went on his page and then kind of went back like i don't know the last like month or so because i hadn't seen anything first of all he's like jacked have you seen him no oh yeah he's yeah. definitely been lifting some weights oh, pull him up pull him up real quick doc he does not look the same anymore he's really he's just like yeah like a like a kind of nerdy you know skinny guy yeah yeah so he's definitely uh he's jacked now oh so, cool yeah, yeah, yeah for him and also, what I thought that why I'm bringing him up that I thought was interesting is uh, he's he's bought like eight companies recently, like acquired Radio Shack and uh, a couple other. Like pull it up; it's in his bio. Uh, the, the, I'm sure you got a good deal. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. No, so he, oh, that's him now. Yeah, Isn't wow, that, he changed. Yeah, yeah. Can you go to his Can you go to his Instagram bio from there, Doug? Do you know how to do that from where you're at? Looks like he's on Maps Anabolic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Anabolic. what's going on right yeah. there. So I, I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out the strategy here. So he's you know he he did this post I read that said like when everybody's going left go right, and he bought uh he bought all of these these companies like Radio Shack. So there there go the top 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 Doug go ahead. there you go right there. Mm. See wow. Radio Shack Dress Barn. What are, read that can't read them all. Pure One, Models, Steinmart, Linens and Things, now, Franklin Mint. Now, these are all companies that were tanking. Yeah, aren't these all companies that were going bankrupt and stuff? Yes. Mm. Well, so Radio Shack, yeah. uh, it's like Mervins, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's like Kmart, trying to save everything. So uh, Radio Shack at one point was um, dominant or everywhere, um, and now they're not. Probably because they're brick and mortar storefront, you know, tech stores that probably got crushed by the internet and by. 
like Apple Store and well, stuff yeah, there's like that. nothing in Radio Shack that you can't order on Amazon cheaper and faster. Right. So what would what do you think he would do? Uh, That's what I buy Radio Shack and then make it online. So like, yeah, use the brand. Uh, yeah. So I imagine that update. Bring it into the 21st century. I imagine that those brands have. Uh, you know, I got it for 15 bucks. They have enough contacts mm-hmm. that the contacts alone, if he could, if he could pivot to somehow take the brands online. Like maybe I don't know. That's why I'm really curious on what the strategy is. I, I I just fell across right before we walked in here. I was showing Justin. I was like, "Oh, bro, look at Ty Lopez." Yeah, go online, yeah. Doug, and look up Radio Shack. I'd like to see their website. I'm trying to think of the last time I bought something there. I, it, what do you call it? Walkie talkies. I think it's the last thing yeah, I purchased dude. there. Yeah. yeah. Well, they always have like cool. Like, you know, if you're like, what a name by the way, walkie talkie. <laughs> walkie talkie. Yeah, I like yeah. a sippy drinky. A sippy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, what have you named everything like that? So you know? condescending. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was yeah. that your hey, 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 you like my new footy yeah. walkies? Okay, yeah. so they still have a website. And what do they? What do they sell? All the same stuff. Batteries. All the little gadgets, you know? Yeah. Okay. I, you know, where's the stock at right now? I bet the stock is like single digits, right? You know what? If you're a big Ty Lopez fan, it might be a good investment if the stock Which is- Which I am. <laughs> if, it, if, it's, <laughs> if the stock sucks. Yeah. I mean, if it's cheap. It is. I think they're all very cheap. I think they've all- Check it out before I speak too soon here because I don't know I could sure. do Well, didn't uh, Gary Vanderchuk, was wasn't he on this uh, for a while? Like he was trying to buy and acquire a bunch of nostalgic type brands- I, I, was he? I don't know. Yeah. Oh my God! It's not even a dollar. What? It's it's point. Was it fourteen cents? Fourteen and a half cents. Well, that mm-hmm. sounds like a decent. Uh, are you sure that's Radio Shack, Doug? It's the only one I know. Okay. So <laughs> that that is a good. It could be a fun gamble. Right. I mean, it, well, we could throw a hundred bucks at it. <laughs> yeah, you put, you know, put a thousand, five grand at it, whatever. You got a bunch of shares, and then just leave it and see what happens. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Very, you know, Radio Shack as a kid, I have to say, was one of my top five places to go in. No, it's cool. When yeah. I was a kid, they had all the gadgets. They had, was, yeah, those remote control helicopters, you know, just flying around the store all the yeah, time. I remember uh, that. Yeah, and uh, it was like remember we just talked about sharper image. It was like the, the more like useful that. sharper image. It was like sharper image, except I bought stuff. Yeah, sharper, <laughs> sharper image. I just walked around and didn't do anything. Yeah. Well, sharper image, you walked around and you're like, uh, this is all cool, yeah. but I don't need any of it. Radio Shack had stuff yeah. you need. Mm, right? Yeah. Isn't that the difference? It did. Did you guys, uh, were you guys ever into radio control cars? Yeah, see, look at Doug. I don't Doug's think I need a laser oh, yeah. pointer they, pen uh, telephone. Yeah, I, you know what <laughs> I mean? exactly. I yeah. was even as an adult, I have the gas radio, power. The gas power. Right power. now you have one? It's somewhere in my storage. Yeah. Oh, those are awesome. They are awesome. So fun yeah, and are. fast, yeah. but you Only, break it real fast. That's the you? problem. That's the problem. Very similar to my big my big car too. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, you get that the high powered cars like that, you know, there's, there's always little things. And so you have to like tinkering. You know what's fun? I'm not a t- I like to play. Have you guys watched, mm-hmm. speaking of playing, have you guys gone on YouTube and watched these uh, drone races? Yeah. As soon as the goggles come down, Nurt comes out and it's time to win. Oh my God, they're awesome. Oh, my yeah. two best friends are in. They it. put, what? Yeah, I've told you guys about this. We talked about wait, it. Wait, wait, wait. They actually so they, sign up and when race? They, they, they wear their VR goggles yeah, and everything. When it first like, got popular, I brought it up on the podcast like, them. shit, four years ago. So my, they actually sign up and go to the races. I was teasing them because they were giving me a hard time for not getting into it. And I even brought up the, the remote control cars. I was like, dude, I got a, oh, you know, yeah, that was a long time I got an $800 remote control car sitting in a storage somewhere because I thought it would be fun and we did it for a few weekends and then it just sits there. I'm like, I'm yeah. not going to fall into that same trap with these stupid fucking. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? You made the company buy drones. <laughs> That's <laughs> different. <laughs> very, very different. Oh, I see the strategy. No, 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 no. Those are racing drones, and that's for all play. At least the company drones. You know, bro, you try, you try to talk us into getting business a, there. How cool was the video that Justin made when he crashed into the scooter? Oh, yeah. Okay, F- we, we have was, used it a few times. That was see what worth, happens. Yeah, that was worth it right I remember when you tried to convince us to get a, a, a float tank in here. I remember. This is what uh, you do, bro. You get into shit, uh, and then you're like, you know what we need, guys? I mean, I'm still- A, a $20,000 uh, well, float tank. I was also in negotiation with somebody idea. that was going to hook it up, though, so that's different. I would not have spent- I would never spend our money like that. Yeah, yeah. But I mean- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never that, bought arcades and put them in the yeah. studio. Well, that's my money. Never. Okay, first of all. And, <laughs> that's true. And those are A. And by the way, okay, you could get online right now and sell both of those for more money than I paid for. Already went wow. up, huh? Oh, yeah, absolutely. What I did got, you, what I did got you? them for a good deal, though. So Investments. How much did you make on them, do you think? Oh, I don't know. They're probably $500 more each than what I paid for. Oh, them. that's all right. Yeah. That's but, not bad. But I mean, they didn't go down, and we've had them, and we could yeah. play with them. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of going up and down, Bitcoin's climbing up again a little bit, huh? I'm so over watching that stuff. Why? It's it's boring, dude. Bitcoin? Yeah. Well, I don't watch it like like <laughs> like a TV show. Yeah. 
But it's uh, it's going up, and I think it'll keep going up because they keep. Uh, so is this going to be our new world's uh, currency? That, I mean, if we keep, you know, if it keeps going this if direction. If we keep creating monopoly money, yeah. there's a new like I don't know how many trillion dollar infrastructure plan they're going to pass. So crazy. Pretty soon, you know, hundred well, saw- dollars won't even buy you a you know a dollar. Yeah, I saw that uh, Visa like uh, is adopting some sort of like crypto. Really? Uh, yeah. Are they really? Yeah, they're working that into their their system somehow. Oh. Snap. Well, I was like, I have, that's a big move. That I, is. I have some like crazy stuff that we can probably have, we're more educated and can speculate on that. I read an article on Tonal. Uh, oh yeah, taking mm-hmm. on two hundred and fifty million dollars. Uh, you know they were uh, they were uh, valued at one point six billion dollars. They got now, acquired by Lou Lemon, right? No, they didn't get acquired. They just took investment money. Yeah, investment they took money. they took on oh. two hundred fifty million dollars at a one point six billion dollar valuation. Um, now. What I want to get into conversation with you guys is, is this overrated, underrated, or properly rated? What do you think? Mm. So here's my fear with uh, Hmm. tech fitness. Tech fitness might get treated like tech in the sense that like new tech tends to get people excited. Mm -hmm. They tend to invest a lot of money. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, it's this new, t-, you know, in, in tonal and, you know, it's, 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 it's looks awesome. You put it on your wall, it gives you workouts, it does all these measurements. So that's the worry. Um, well, do you know, well, do you know why it's valued this high? Do you know why? It's not because it's the exercise. No, I, I'm assuming the it's because of all the, right? yeah, they get all the information on people. Yeah. I mean, they, they are banking on this becoming just like a, a television or a mirror or anything else in your house that becomes every like full entertainment just, center. Yeah. Well, just it's, it, it will be beca- fitness based. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's fitness based, but it's becoming something that everybody will have in their home. And use it that way, and they'll be able to collect all this data on them. Right? So, so this is what so I it's mean. It's not about like the the exercise thing being revolutionary, like you know, Nordatrack came out. So it's 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 in a different class than mm-hmm. any sort of and exercise. That, and that's what I mean. That's where my fear is because they're treating it like a tech company because of all this analytics. The mm-hmm. problem is to connect to collect all those analytics and to make them valuable. People have to work out mm-hmm. unless it's got entertainment on its own. In which case, I'd say that's and maybe they do right. They could possibly if they if they get in enough homes. Yeah, like maybe oh, you know, like maybe it teaches you how to cook and you can pull up a chef, yeah. or you can pull or up. Or maybe a, it becomes also a television too. Like who knows what they could possibly. Well, that's do. a that's a big leap to have. Uh, Agree. You know, like everybody like adopting this into their house like is is a sort of a, a furniture like the standard thing that everybody's sort of incorporating. Uh, I think. Uh, you know something that would make more sense to me is still with the wearables. I think we've we've gone away from the wearables a bit, but incorporating that with the programming on the TVs, I, I think that uh, you know interacting with the the data and, and being able to visually see it is going to be big. So I, I actually thought I brought this up thinking that maybe we we disagree a little bit. And we can get into a nice little debate, but I'm I'm not only with you guys. I actually think it's it's grossly overrated. Mm, yeah, I think I think it's way overvalued. Ah, great, and, great minds, right? Well, Damn. isn't that weird? I mean, you you, you, you conflict. You well, you bring up the point. Uh, I think is is so important here. Like, okay, let's look at all the other platforms that this is all the data is so valuable. Right. Facebook, you know, Netflix, right. You know, computer stuff, anything like stuff th- that you, you people just use binge. a lot. All they the time. binge. Yeah. Right. Nobody yes. binges they, fitness. Nobody binges fitness. And even the people that do <laughs> use this this tool, this the stats show that they're more likely to quit in a few weeks and right. stop using it and it'll become the something. novelty wears off. So that's the bottleneck with anything fitness related it's always going to come back to one thing is how do we get more people to use it and this is the most important part stay consistent if you can figure that out in the fitness space Mm -hmm. you are now you are crushing now you're dominating the world but if you can't do that uh, well, this was Justin it. and I's invention, right? Or yeah. our our idea with the app, with gamifying mm-hmm. fitness, try to get more people to, to use try, it. and that that I, and I think that's one of the the best angles towards this. But even our idea, it still requires work from people. Yeah, yeah. and it's still it's, the novelty aspect it's is a always. Big ask. Yeah, yeah and always. if you if we look historically, the only thing that's ever consistently got people to be active, really, and I hate to say this, but there's only one thing, and that's when people's lives normal lives are organized around activity. And what I mean by that is not necessarily structured activity, but rather you live in a city where it is more advantageous to walk and move and go places. And so you see that quite a bit. People who live in cities way more active than people who live in suburbs. And it's not because people live in cities value fitness more. It's because when you live in San Francisco, 
It doesn't make sense to drive to the grocery store, drive to this place because it's just it's ridiculous. No parking. It's stupid. You walk. You walk everywhere. And so this is the, this is the only thing historically that's shown how to get massive masses amount of people to be consistent and be active. Yeah. So far, we have not been able to break, you know, the, the that problem. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. No, I think it's a very competitive market. I think that it's it's very overvalued. Um, I think it's cool. I think it's a cool mm-hmm. tool. Yeah. I do think there is a. But I mean, I, I thought NordaTrack is cool. I think Bowflex is cool. Mm-hmm. Like those are all great tools, and they all have this like they have this moment where everyone's like, there was a moment when Bowflex was the shit, right? Don't you yeah. remember? There was a moment. Bro, when, how many moments have we seen? Right, I know. Space? That's what I well, mean. Well, that's the thing. It's just trends. They just come and go so much in this industry. Nothing's really like lasted the test of time well, other it's than not, the foundational things. It's yep. not revolutionary. Yeah. Uh-huh. There's not, there, it's not, you're not getting anything that you couldn't do with a set of bands and dumbbells or a barbell, right. either yourself or in a gym. Mm-hmm. So you're you're completely relying on the the cool factor mm-hmm. of that it hangs on your wall and that takes you through it and it's interactive. Yeah, and this is one of the problems that I mean we we tackled as trainers. I talk about this in the resistance training revolution, which is the main issue that we need to look at. One of the main issues is people just you, know, you got to accept this. People in fitness, you need to accept this. Okay, the average person is not going to work out every day. Okay, that's it. It's not yeah. going to happen. The average person, maybe you can get them, if you're good, consistently to work out, to have structured exercise two days a week, maybe three, and that's it. That's average if they're doing a good job. So the form of exercise that they choose needs to be effective at two or three days a week. Mm -hmm. And that's why we talk about resistance training so much. I don't know any of the form of exercise that you could consistently see progress at two days a week. Uh, like resistance training. And that's why that's one of the main reasons why that's the the form of exercise we preach about so much. I keep waiting to see, you know, more movement in in the direction of incentivizing people. So, uh, you know, in terms of like gathering all this data and having stuff uh, available to people, yeah, great. But where's the big, uh, you know, pull for for, for people to, uh, you know, see dollars in terms of like like lowering their uh, health insurance costs, like, uh, you know, their work sort of covering a certain portion portion of that, like, I think we could do a much better job of actually incentivizing your average person to even be interested in that You know what the direction. problem with that is? is it, in, now, first off, with insurance, you do get a little better if you have better health parameters. Yeah, but that's but they've tried. Gen- generic. You're right. They've tried to come up with, uh, you know, and companies have tried this. Not very said, hard. If you exercise, you get this. If you do that, then you, they, get, they get slapped with discriminatory, uh, discrimination by saying, oh, you're discriminating against me because I'm... I don't want to exercise or because you're, you're fat shaming me or whatever. So well, that's, that's one of the stupid. big, do you think that's really why a hundred percent? Really? Yes. Wow. If that's you, like, if you had a company and, and you know, by the way, Japan does this, uh, uh there's a lot of companies in Japan. You show up in the morning and they do group exercise. Mm-hmm. I, I know this cause Doug told me this, this is like one of the cultural things. You try doing that here. You have a company, you tell them, all right, everybody show up at 8 AM. We're doing 20 minutes of calisthenics. You are going to get people who are going to say, no, you're discriminating me because I can't do it, because I'm I'm overweight, you're fat shaming me. Companies are like, whatever, do the fuck you want. We're wow. not going to do that anymore. Haven't we seen, haven't we seen this with um, uh, car insurance? Aren't there, aren't there some car insurance that now have this, you can sign up for like their app and it like basically tracks your speed yeah. and tracks how, how many miles I you like drive. That. And then it then it actually gives you a better rate on your insurance based off of it. Isn't, yeah. that, doesn't, isn't that an exist right now? I, yeah. I, I believe so. Similar concept, right? I mean, if you're... You, they show that you don't drive very much. You're a safer driver. You should get a little bit lower insurance. Mm-hmm. I would think the same thing. You should be able to do something similar with health insurance. That oh, looks like he's checked into the gym yeah. six days this week, and he's been doing that consistently. So we can. We the, can- the, the two things that I think are effective, just based off of experience, are: Do you have good fitness professionals that are working with people? Because those are the only times I've ever seen long-term uh, real success. And then the second one. I'm going to say it again. You need to design cities so that movement becomes a part of everyday life. If you design cities so that it's, if you live in the suburbs, going on a cattle herding. Yeah, you either go on a walk just to go on a walk, or if you want to get anywhere, you you drive. It doesn't make sense to walk somewhere. Is there a gym, Justin, that this exists? I know we talked about this before. I thought this was such a a fascinating idea, and I think it's up north somewhere in Washington. Is it where the the roof is like solar power? Uh, All the equipment is if you exercise, it generates fully green gym. Yes, I think that's cool. I always thought what would be cool is. 
you could actually run and exercise your membership. Your efforts off. produce something. Yeah, right? if your like energy. The to, more to you run work, it. the more you work out, the less you pay. Yeah, like so. Yeah, let's say you have a two hundred dollars membership, but if you actually you could actually put enough energy into the gym that it would take you down to zero. Like, how cool would that be? Now, how successful is that? Is that gym? Has it done? well? I don't know. Yeah, I, I haven't followed up. With I don't it. know. I haven't actually looked at. I think they looked at this like years ago. Yeah, right. It was, a, it was totally a novel idea back then because this is when like tech was really kind of adopted fitness and they're like oh what we can do like we'll have these uh you know these special treadmills that you can run and then that's going to power the lights and stuff in the gym and like they had all these solar uh panels everywhere that's and stuff it i think it's brilliant where do you see where do you see the fault like where do you see that it would i don't see people caring i don't see it working i don't think people are going to be ever well, if you're really about global warming you know efforts like those yeah, people need to go in there a lot of people say they are but look at their well, i know that's, that's what i mean that's what i like to say well yeah. i mean i, I would Sh think it would be the money well you know they i don't think they did what i what i was suggesting which is reduce their their monthly fees because i think that is what would motivate you to do it there's yeah. there, I, so i've seen these uh like these fit challenges have you guys seen these where people say um if you or trainers who say if you if you hit your goal your training was free yeah I've seen that before. Now, I've, what done, I, I've done that with clients. Now, what mm -hmm. I'd like to see, though, is the long term. Uh, are, are they able to keep it off? Doesn't work very well. Right. Yeah. It, it, that's my point with yeah. this whole thing. Yeah, I, right. It's not very effective long yeah, term. Yeah. No, you're right. It doesn't work very yeah, well. Yeah, because what the fitness space does is it, it trades. There's a 20% of the a population that works out rel relatively consistently. They're constantly fighting over that 20%. The 80%, like we have yet to really figure out a way yeah. to get them to do something on a consistent basis. Well, and, I just think that's why we need more competitive ideas out there to try. Well, so when I was a kid, uh, uh, I, was, I, remember, I don't remember what class it was. It was econ or English. We had to make a commercial with our friends. So did you guys ever do this in school? They're like, make a commercial, produce it, and then we'll watch it and no. grade it. Anyway, uh -uh. we had to make a commercial. And I made, my buddy and I did uh, a diet. We called it the Guido diet. So essentially, <laughs> <laughs> he, he was like, you know, we made him, we, like we stuffed his shirt full of pillows. So he's like an overweight guy or whatever. Uh -huh. And then he signs up and I, I'm i Guido. And I'm like, all right, you're, you know what? And he's like, how am I going to lose weight? I'm like, don't worry, it's going to work. It's just know? a bunch of blended meatballs. No, I'm, it's going to work. You'll lose some weight. Like, all right. Yeah. And then he closes the door and he, and he goes to his fridge. He opens it and he grabs a donut and he takes a bite. And then I open the door and I kick his ass. And I'm like, every, time, <laughs> every, time you, every time you eat something you're not supposed to, I'm going to kick your ass, you know? I lost 30 pounds in, in one week yeah. with the Guido diet, you know? That's pretty good, actually. Yeah. Uh, That's the only thing I can think of that would be effective. You actually get your ass kicked every time. Yeah, you know? yeah, so I'll be watching Tonal and Mirror. I'm really curious to see how these... Peloton's still kind of holding. You know, it went down, and it looks like it's going a little bit back Well, up. they they also... Um, there's there's a uh, that's a like a niche group right yeah like they, there there's there is a big group of people that love cycling classes yeah, yeah. already right this would be so to me that that's a different almost a different category although the, I would they would be considered as competitors for the same probably the market their market share they're going after I really think uh, one is different than the other I I think and I think Peloton has a stronger foothold than Tonal mm. Tonal is trying to create that. That that group of people that love doing tonal already or mirror, where Peloton, it are there's already huge Soul Cycle people and people that love cycling class, and now you've offered them this ability to do this home and still kind of connect with their friends. Totally. So there's already what a great point. There's yeah. already a very strong group of people. It's already proven. Essentially. Yes, exactly. Where. There isn't like these classes that are being held with these digital tonal things, right. and people are like, "Yes, now I can do it from my house." Yeah, that's so good they're point. trying to but prove that. So I, if I had to put my money too on, big of a leap on those two companies, now well, tonal's my money is there, right? Now, we have money in Peloton. Yeah, but not so in tonal's tonal. not public, right? Obviously, um, so we don't know what their financials look like. But yeah. I wonder if we can see. No, I do. I've, I've, I've really, I, you I, looked at. Well, I don't know what the, the exact. So don't hold me to that. I, I listened to an interview with the CEO like a year ago. They're, they they run in the red. So they're like many other tech companies, right? Yeah. So That's what I mean. I feel like the excitement's they because need to of the get yes. user, a yeah. user base. Yes, mm -hmm. because the user base is growing so rapidly. That's where they get that valuation. So not it's all because, in potential. They think yes, it's happen. not because they're generating billions and billions of dollars. They're running in the red, and that's another reason why I think they're so overrated. Is because this is an, this is all on speculation. And yes, we're pretty accurate with things like Snapchat and YouTube and all these other and Instagram. Like as far as those valuations, yeah, you're not go, asking people. Well, to work that's the interesting. <laughs> thing is like yes they made a, a product but really their their main revenue is the people that are using the product yes so and like they're selling those people and there's a lot different there's a definitely different behaviors around snapchat instagram facebook youtube 
than there is with tonal yeah. and peloton yeah. and those type yeah, of. Yeah, nobody's doing curls on the toilet. Yeah, you're definitely scrolling and, and, through Facebook. And nobody is literally addicted and spending six to eight hours a day. Which there is lots of people spending six to eight hours a day on social media platforms. That's a yeah. very common, very very, very common. common. Yeah. All right, I'm going to take a left turn here. I just I read an article today uh, about a young lady who, a young girl, who as a parent I would be so proud of this kid. Let me tell you about this little girl. So she's an eight year old Girl Scout. And she set the record for selling Girl Scout cookies. You want to you want to guess how many she sold in a single season? Boxes. How many? What's a season? Three Hundreds. months? A month? Two months? I have no year. Oh, I have no idea what a season is. I'm sure. It's a, Did she get up to the thousand range? Thirty two thousand boxes. What? Over thirty two thousand boxes of Girl Scout cookies. Now here's a crazy thing. Somebody what, needs she, to hire what does her. she do? I want to hear. People thought that she got like a big transaction or a big business sponsor to buy from them. Not true. The biggest order placed was 100 boxes. Wow. She reached 32,000 boxes out of everyone seeing value and buying one box, two boxes, four boxes, and everyone working together to try to be a small piece of a really big puzzle. So this little girl. So okay, tell where me. Where was her honey well? She must have had a mission behind what she was doing, or yeah. she had some sort of a strategy. What was it? Yeah. Just going out. We boothed 11 hours straight outside our house and sold 500 boxes in one day. And it's and her mom. This is her mom. It's Lily being Lily. She does not like somebody telling her something is not possible. Oh, wow. makes me emotional. Wow. You imagine if that was your kid? Yeah, yeah. It's just like, no, Dad, I need to win this. That's and incredible. So with one week left in the season, she was at 26,000 boxes. So in one week, she went from 26 to 32,000 in order to break the record. I'm a, oh, so she broke the record. She did. Wow. She's the record holder. And what's crazy about Dang. that, there was no like hack. Like she didn't. Get into a big company. No, she said the right. greatest dad sing- isn't like famous and sold a bunch for her. <laughs> no, dude, oh, sold wow. a bunch on eBay. You know, you know funny? Or remember, this- the, remember the kid like five years ago who who, did, who hacked into like sitting in front of the dispensaries? I thought that was brilliant. Too. Oh, oh come on, dude, are yeah. you kidding me? Yeah, that's, that's scary. scary. I thought that was I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, you gonna sell cookies? Outside? I thought you were gonna say what? that. I thought that's yeah. what it was. I, I thought <laughs> it's like oh, she got in front of all the. dispensaries. You got a free joint with every box of cookies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're gonna sell something. But I mean, if if you're gonna predict a kid's gonna be successful, I mean that right there. Yeah. How old are you in Girl Scouts? How old is she? She's, She's going to do just fine. Yeah. Eight years old. Wow. Yeah. One, I remember my son one one time. He was real young. He must have been six or seven. And this was like one of those moments where you like tear up or whatever. He wanted to sell uh, Kool-Aid to, to people on the block. So I said, sure. You know, and I'm like, I didn't tell him to do anything. I'm like, I want to see where his mind is at. So we yeah. go to the store. How many flavors do you want? And he's like, two. And I'm like, okay. I said, you sure you don't want like five or six flavors? He goes, no, he goes, it's too many choices. I want people just to have two. And I'm like, okay. Mm, like, this is my, some thought there. My smart. It's my yeah. kid. It's, I yeah. love this, right? So then we do the whole thing. And then we, you know, I help him set up his little table and everything. I said, how much do you want to sell each glass of Kool-Aid for? And he go, and he's thinking about it. And we had this discussion. He's like, a dollar, two dollars. And I'm really trying hard not to direct him in any way, right? Mm-hmm. And then he something, said something, one of the most brilliant things he's ever said. He goes, I think I'm going to make it free. I'm like, free? I'm like, how are you supposed to make any money with free? He goes, when people get the cup and I ask me how much, I'll say, it's free, but you can give me however much money you want uh, if you like the cup. <laughs> <laughs> That's the move. So you got this cute little kid telling yeah. you that, and it worked, dude. He of would course. say, people were like, of how course. much? He'll get $5 probably for lemonade. Dude, this one guy, he's like, how much is it? And my son's like, it's free, but you can give me whatever you want. And the dude's like, 20 bucks, you know, 30 bucks. Yeah. He made a hell of money. Like, he had like five people show up. He made like 100 bucks. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. I yeah. love that. Yeah. That's, that's such a good thing. That's, that's so good. Yeah, such a good thing to, to dude, do. I, uh, uh, I, I was reading, um, I think I think it was a scientific article, but basically, like I just found out that um, they were able to find uh, in the permafrost these these worms that were fifty thousand something years old. That basically they thawed them out, and immediately after they thawed them out, they started to to eat. Uh, and come back wow. to life completely. That's so fucked up. If, if it makes, if it's true, it, like it makes them the oldest living species that they that they found. Fifty thousand year old worm, and it's it was in suspended animation. Suspended animation. Yeah. Oh, that's how weird, dude. crazy is it? I almost feel like uh, you know I don't know. This always takes me down the sci-fi route. Is, yeah. You know, is this going to be okay? Are yeah. We gonna, we- <laughs> well, you should look at the picture. If, if you zoom in, of course, it's you, like it's like Godzilla. It larva. has like these little teeth, and it looks like one of those uh, tunneling worms, you know, from uh, uh, Dune or something like that. 
you know, or, or tremors or something. It looks like one of those kind of worms. Yeah. It's freaky. It's going to get inside someone. Yeah. Imagine that into- getting all big and large and, you know, start eating us all. That is wild. You know, they, they, I've heard them say, I've read some articles on permafrost because, uh, you know, because the, the climate is warming up that a lot of this permafrost is is melting and they're afraid that there, it may release ancient viruses yes. that our bodies have no resistance and no immunity to. You know, what? hundreds of thousands of years old yeah. viruses that come out and, you know, like next thing you know, we're, you know. I always trip out when I hear something like 50,000 years. Like how, how do they pinpoint down to that? Like is, is it's carbon dating is how they do that, right? Is that, is that how they would do I don't know how they do that, that with the worm. Yeah, I know. Oh, right? you know what they probably did with the worm is they probably dated the soil around it. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, how are you going to date the worm? That's what I'm saying. Couldn't half re- count the rings? <laughs> I have no idea, dude. <laughs> Works for trees? You fucking killed it's it. It's above my pay grade. I just know what I read. Yeah, Adam's always... <laughs> I'm hella skeptical that, about this shit. I am. That's how do scientists know this yeah. bullshit? They're like, yeah, his birthday Our was uh, really March real. 13th, and it was... <laughs> what the fuck? How do you figure that out? You had a worm birth certificate? Yeah, 50,000 years old. Like, <laughs> I feel like it's just a bunch of old scientists, nerds guys, like taking like a random guess. Like, what do you think? And they're yeah. just throwing numbers yeah. out. And they're like, yeah, we'll go with Who's that. Who's going to tell us we're wrong? Wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. Who's going to argue with us? Yeah. Like, I am. Let's I'm going to argue it for with fishing you. bait. Yeah. yeah. Like, well, I know the. Say. I know up until then, or if this is the oldest living species, the uh, the oldest living animal currently, I think, was a, a shark, right? That they found in uh, in the waters of Greenland. Oh yeah. yeah, someone just shared that with us. It was like hundreds of years old. Two or three hundred years old. Yeah. Three hundred years old. It was two or three hundred? Like two sixty eight? I think it's, it was someone shared it to us, right? Yeah, it was the oldest shark. That's for sure. Dude, isn't that weird? Yeah, that's like great. like yeah, somebody in the you know the eighteen hundreds could have like fed this shark. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, there it is. Two hundred and seventy-two years old. Wow. Uh, and as much as five hundred and twelve, huh? It, does it still have? That's teeth? a nice range. Look at that thing. How did they, how did they come up with that range? I wonder oh. what that shark has seen. Yeah, I know, right? That's crazy. What's the Blood. oldest? What's the oldest thing you guys have ever seen? Like not living, but the oldest. Have you guys been to like Rome or? Oh or yeah, like ruins? in Paris. Like yeah, going to like seeing some of like the churches and things like that. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. probably that. Like I mean, how old is Louvre? That's pretty old too, right? The Louvre, the stuff in the museum. Is yeah. incredibly. I mean, there's stuff in there that's thousands of years old. Yeah, so yeah. that's probably the oldest. Oh, stuff I was immediately seen. thinking like old growth redwoods, but that's boring. Yeah, yeah. no, that's cool, dude. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's uh, like whatever. It always uh, uh, nothing. I can literally look at something that's old and stare at it for hours. So just imagine, you know, all the stuff that's been around it and what it's seen. And stuff. Yeah, yeah, pretty wild. I have some uh, controversial stuff that Doug loves for us to talk oh, about. Hell yeah. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah! He always, he always gets excited. Look when at his face. Us. Yeah, no, that's the face of someone yeah. who's excited. <laughs> he's got he's got his finger on the edit button right now. I just I, this is more your wheelhouse, Sal, and so I just I I want to have this discussion because I'm I'm curious, right? I just the the strategy and the thought process behind this. So this last week, uh, uh, Oakland mayor passed this oh uh, God, this deal going. where yeah. he is they're going to give five hundred dollars to fifty percent or people that are fifty percent below the poverty line. So people who are poor, yes. really, really really poor. Yeah, and I read deeper into this, by the way, because I kind of mentioned we we mentioned it lightly off air before, and then I kind of went down the rabbit hole to kind of read more. I think about it's what five hundred bucks a month. Yeah, it's five hundred bucks a month, and it's uh, the idea is that what's that what's that called? Where the, the UBI? No, 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 uh, universal. universal basic. Income. Yes, yes, yeah, UBI. Right. So uh, that's the idea is they're testing that. Mm-hmm. And they did this, I guess, a year, a couple of years ago in Stockton. Stockton tried to do this before too, mm-hmm. and now they're trying to do it in addition. Now I know the the art, the headlines that got all the controversy was the uh, that it was excluding white people. Yeah, but it, what I read deeper into it, and it doesn't fucking matter. It's going to exclude a ton of people anyways. The math doesn't even make sense. So they've got like private money, and I want to say it was in like nine or ten million dollars or something like that. Okay, and when you do the math on how many how many people are 50% below the poverty line, you can't even cover all you know, all the minorities, mm. much less the, the white people. But too. one of the criteria is you have to be a minority. Yes, you can't you, be white. You, no. So yeah. if you're a poor white person- You're fucked. Yeah, you don't get <laughs> yeah, yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, obviously two you're thoughts on that. Poorer. One, uh, that's uh, explicitly uh, racist, So, but we don't need to talk about that because it's obvious. If you're excluded from something explicitly in law yeah. because you're a gender or specific race- that is the definition of, of discrimination. So let's cut that out for a second. Let's just talk about universal basic income. I like universal basic income as a replacement for our current welfare system, not in addition to. I think that's ridiculous. If you add to the current bureaucracy and welfare system, it makes no sense. It's just going to cost way more money, and it's not going to help anybody, really. It may be in the short term, but definitely not in the long term. 
if you replace welfare, here's why I think it's absolutely it's a it's a better option. First and foremost, people don't realize this, but the bureaucracy that administers and manages welfare, that means all the government agencies and regulation, all that stuff, costs a lot of money. So I don't know what the number is, but just it's something along the lines of for every dollar that goes to someone in welfare, 50 cents goes to pay some person to manage it and administer it. So it's, it's a ridiculous waste of resources. So what I would do is I would cut that, el eliminate all of that, and just give people Just go cash. direct to them. Just give them cash. Yeah. So automatically you reduce, you save a ton of money. It's more efficient. And then the second reason is because I think if we're going to give people money, I think more often than not, there's going to be people who are going to spend Because people need to be able to spend it the way they want to. And sure, some people are going to spend it on stupid shit. But there are going to be some people who take it and invest it in business pay for their kid's school, pay for their education, and they're going to have a better opportunity to lift themselves out of poverty. Now, in theory, this sounds like a pretty good idea, but the more I think about it, it doesn't make that much sense because if you gave everybody $500 to it, I mean everybody, so UBI, right? So everybody- Well, the way I would do it would be like a, a negative income tax. Ah. So you, you the, it, it, down a certain level, then you start to get money. Okay. Not everybody. Not everybody. No, it doesn't make sense to give you yeah, know, that make Elon Musk, uh, you know, UBI. Okay, so then, so then only at a certain income level they get it. But yeah. now wouldn't that inevitably bring up Milk and gas and everything. You mean for inflation? Yeah. Um, not any more than, than the current welfare system. If anything, it would probably uh, reduce it a little bit because, like I said, the wasteful uh, the, the wasteful aspects of it. Um, yeah, inflation is always an issue. Um, but if we take it from uh, money that we've collected, it's not going to be as inflationary. Now, if we print money, that's when it gets really inflationary. But if it's collected through taxes, so with the negative income tax, the people paying the tax on it would pay for the people receiving it. One of the drawbacks with it is is the same drawback you get with any system like that, which is you you may incentivize people to never take care of themselves. And this is actually statistically true in many cases. You see generations of people mm -hmm. who you, you, they lose their sense of meaning and purpose and they just collect their check and then it, it just, they never lift themselves out uh, of poverty or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And we saw this, we saw this huge reduction in poverty until we implemented the great, you know, like war on poverty. Uh, this was a thing that happened decades ago, and then poverty stuck. It kind of stuck and really didn't change yeah. uh, after a while. But yeah, it saves money, which is why I like it, and I think it gives people more freedom. So I know that there's some people who are poor who, if you give them a check, instead of telling them we're going to give you some discounts in housing, some food stamp, some right. people will take that money and go and. Spend Spend it wisely for themselves because they know how to spend it better than for themselves, better than anybody else. Yeah. And then they'll lift themselves. That that would be that's my theory around the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, and I think I mean I'm totally on board with that. I think that's you know that would be a great way to to see. Like uh, the only thing is is having a structured kind of plan for them to transition into. Like it, I don't know. I guess I was thinking of uh, something I saw with with the homeless community where there was a program where they actually had like a couple steps involved where you know you get a certain amount you know, per week, you get a, you get housing. And then if you show your efforts in a direction, you get job interviews, you, they kind of like level it out and tear it out. So that way it kind of reintroduces you into society. Um, I don't know that, you know, just giving money without any kind of program or plan, uh, you know, we'll see like what that would do. So now obviously the amount of people below poverty, uh, because our population is rapidly growing, mm -hmm. that would, it'd be obvious that is also by person growing too, right? So person to person, but percentage wise, that's what I want to know. Flat, it's about the same. It's, it's, it's not, it's about the same. Now, if you look at their real purchasing power, um, they're, they have increased in wealth, uh, as well, all levels of increased in wealth. So somebody today uh, in poverty has way more than somebody, uh, has way more purchasing power with what they have. Well, I mean, it was somebody 30 years it ago. It was just a decade or two ago when you would have to be rich to own a flat screen TV. Right. So innovation is done that. to have, you know, a cell phone where, uh, you know, you see, you know, people. Hey, is somebody right now in lower middle class has more stuff than, <clears throat> than the, than Genghis Khan did or the emperor of Rome did mm -hmm. because it didn't exist. Innovation has made these things available to people to where, um, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're obviously, you know, in context, you're lower middle class, but you're still way better off than someone was 30, 40 years ago. Mm. But yeah, back to what you're saying, uh, Justin, that's always the, the drawback. However, you know, what gets in the way of that, uh, laws that, that actually tell companies and people that they can't pay people 
less than a certain amount because that, you I know, it's so frustrating. you price them out. You know, yeah. if, if the minimum wage is ten dollars, and somebody's like, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna turn my life around. I got no skills, got a prison record. Exactly, I was gonna say this is where like ex cons have such a, a difficult time, like even living outside of being in prison. Yeah, so you're gonna go to a job and you're competing for ten or fifteen dollars an hour. That company has really no incentive to hire you, give you a chance. But if you go there and you say, look, I know everybody right now is asking for 10. Mm -hmm. I'll do it for five. Mm -hmm. Now the company's like, oh, you know what? Let's see what yeah. happened. Then you start to build yeah, we'll experience. Give you a shot. You yes, know? Yeah. yes. And it gives them that opportunity. So that's one of the things that you know kind of annoys me. I would like to see a lot more. Yeah. Of Speaking of cool stuff, uh, some studies came out on CBD showing that it improved cognition in people with Alzheimer's and it reduced the amyloid plaque a buildup that is one of the, the things that causes wow. the issues with Alzheimer's. So CBD and cannabinoids in particular um, may be a treatment. Now, you've been following this space for a really long time. Are you seeing the amount of research just like, is it rapidly growing? Dude, it's I feel like you, you mentioned CBD stuff now, like studies that are coming out. You know, here's the thing. And are they way better than what they were just five, ten a years ago? Absolutely. You know, here's one of the wonderful things about uh, cannabinoids, um, and, and there's a lot of them, by the way. It's not just CBD. You know, that's why if you ever use a cannabinoid product, you want to get something that's what they'll call full spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. the whole plant because they all work better together. You don't want to isolate one because you really minimize the potential uh, benefits. You want something that has them all. But the studies are are remarkable, and really, if you want to think about it this way, I've heard it explained by uh, some some scientists in the field. I thought this was a brilliant explanation. The cannabinoid system is like a light dimmer switch. Okay, so a light you turn it on or off, so it's bright or it's dark. What cannabinoids do is they activate this system in the body that will dim the light or turn it up. So what does that mean? That means if you have uh, an autoimmune disorder. Uh, let's say you have Crohn's disease where your own immune system is hyper reactive and attacking itself, then it would dim the immune system a little bit to prevent this from happening. So now when, say, you, when you say that, so I have an autoimmune, right? My, my psoriasis mm -hmm. is considered an autoimmune. I know certain things flare it up. Like say if I eat excessive amounts of sugar or dairy or uh, gluten, so are you saying to me that theoretically I should be able to say I did one of those things that would 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 offend that, right? Mm -hmm. If I took like, you know, the full spectrum hemp with that, it should mitigate it. It should be less it should be less bad on my so I should see less of a flare up because P of that? Potentially, but it's more of a long term effect. So it'd be like if you're using it on a relatively regular basis. Oh, because there's a build up. Yeah. So okay. it's not like a acute <clears throat> effect. There is an acute effect. If you take C B D you do feel chill, relaxed, all that stuff. But then over time you start to see uh these kinds of effects. Right. I was going to ask you in terms of like in the study, was it uh, real high concentrated doses or was this over a long period of time with just, you know, kind of regular doses? You know, that's a good question. I should look that up. I do know that uh, CBD in a lot of these studies is used at pretty high doses, you know, yeah. 25 milligrams, 50 milligrams. Uh, very safe uh, for most people. Very, very safe for most people. It can affect how your liver processes certain drugs. Mm -hmm. So you might want to make sure if you're on other medications. Uh, if it's not going to, you know, change the half life or whatever they call it of the of the medication, but yeah, I'll look that up and I'll 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 get that uh, that that number for you. But yeah, it's remarkable because uh, you know we're dealing with a lot of chronic shit in modern societies, and the medicines that we create are just like symptom control. Yeah. You know, nothing really. Like I was saying with the immune system, people with you know immune systems that are depressed, they show that CBD ramps it yeah. up, so it's like it balances you well, out. This is what's so promising about you know that space, and also with mushrooms as well. Like they have these sort of adaptogenic type properties where they can they can work you know uh, you know in tandem with with certain medications and other treatments that you're doing. Yeah, I remember years ago when I was really getting into this. Um, I remember thinking how bullshit it sounded. I'm like, oh, so cannabinoids help everything? Like that sounds like. <laughs> Snake oil. Totally. But when you look at the receptors that it attaches to, they're one of the most abundant in the in the body. They're found everywhere. Right. And so if it's like a light dimmer switch for the whole body, right. well, then it's going to balance things out. So this is why if you take you know people's experience, for example, we work with a company called Ned and they have the, the hemp oil. The messages I'll get from people range from it chills me out to it gives me energy. And you think, how is that possible? Yeah. Because it's that balancing thing. So it just makes you feel better. And if that means you need a little more energy or if that means you need to be a little more relaxed, 
then you'll probably get you know what you're kind of looking for. Very interesting. Hey, real quick before we get to the questions, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free guides. It's great information. We wrote it, so it's really good. Go check it out. All right, enjoy the rest of the podcast. First question is from M. Lou Weber. Working from home, getting steps in is much more of a challenge. If I have an hour at the gym, should I lift the entire time or sacrifice 15 to 20 minutes to get some steps in for the day? What serves me more? Mm, okay, so they both have value. Oh, um, the weights are going to serve you more. Yeah, if you had to pick one, pick the resistance training. You're still being active while doing the resistance training, but you're also simultaneously sending a very beneficial adaptation signal to the body, which is build muscle, which burns more calories, makes you more insulin sensitive, balances out your hormones more. It's just going to serve you better. Now, that being said... Uh, you should do that and add steps if possible because well, being yeah. active is just good. The only way I see this this question even makes sense is if somebody's like on this like very strict time restraint, right? right? Like they have, they have lunch. They have a lunch break and that's when they normally work yeah. out and so it's like 12 to 1. That's They have to get in and get out. Uh, if, if, I'm, if I have, and I've had clients like this, so they're, they follow a resistance training program in that window and then I try and get them to, hey, when you get home from work, how about go for, before you just stop your day, mm -hmm. go for a half hour walk mm -hmm. or extend your walk with your dog or, you know, walk like with your park, spouse. Park really far away and like yeah. have more strategies that you can implement where it promotes more activity in, in different parts of your day. Yeah. Cause I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever allow a client give me the uh, either or like, it's yeah. like, I'm either going to do this or I'm going to do that. Which one I'm only going to do one. It's like, no, that they both should be in your lifestyle. Yeah. So I actually had a few clients like this. They were executives and they were very like, no, I only have time to come see you and then the rest of the time I'm at my desk and that's it. And I actually did a couple experiments with them and I said, let's try something. I said, let's try something because, and they were very science heavy kind of people. So I pulled up studies to show that productivity improves through activity. So I said, you're obviously very serious about your job. I said, let's do a test. Here's what I want you to do. Every hour, take a 10 minute activity break. So every hour, take 10 minutes and just go for a walk. Walk the office, walk around outside. At the end of the day, see if you've been more productive or less productive and how do you feel? And every single person that did this said that they got more done, they were more creative and they had a better day at work. Mm -hmm. So it's funny because taking the time out to do that, you think I'm losing that that time, but the reality is you get you know more time in terms of productivity and creativity. Because when you're working, it's not about... I mean, we've, we, you know, we've all owned companies. I don't care how many hours you clock in. I, I care about what you did. That's right. You right? know, so yeah, the if, outcome. Yeah. So you eight hours, but you did one hour work worth of work. You're fired. Isn't there, a, there's a, there's a study they did on that, right? Didn't they do a, a I don't know if it was a survey or an actual study of like uh, the average eight hour person that works yeah. mm -hmm. uh, the amount of productivity is Dude, actually like, yeah, two, I wonder what that, the average of like how long you can, you can. You keep your focus on one specific thing. That's why you're, you're seeing a lot of success with some of these companies since COVID that did like, you know, even before COVID happened, you saw some, I think Microsoft did it where they, they got rid of Fridays where mm -hmm. it's a four day, four day work week where you're working longer hours and they found an increase in productivity. Mm -hmm. I think the average person who works the five, eight hour day shift, I think it was, I think it said two or just three fill hours. it up with fluff. Yeah. You're on, you're, you're surfing social media instead. Yeah. When I'm, when I'm writing or doing something like that requires me to sit down and be intense. If I get up and do a trigger session in, you know, every, you know, couple hours or whatever, mm -hmm. way more productive, way more productive. Oh. I get way more done. So Especially it's like, when I'm stuck and, and, and I'm in a train of thought and I can't move forward or like I need to come up with something. I have to go for a walk and then it just, you know, it takes some time. Dude, but it comes movement, to movement, uh, stimulates, uh, creative thought. If a hundred percent does, it does think about your best ideas. It also increases mood too. I mean, it, be, way better mood after you move around. Absolutely. Think about some of your best ideas. They usually come from you moving and yeah. then kind of being present. So you're there in the shower or you're walking and you're just kind of looking around, not distracted. Like, oh man, I got this idea. Oh, right. I, I figured out this thing. I don't it's know. The shitter's pretty good for that too. <laughs> <laughs> you, you in the Lots moment? Lots of brilliant yeah, ideas yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Are you in the moment when you're taking a poop? Yeah. Uh, oh. Pretty sure I started a few companies in there, dude. <laughs> Adam, this new company's the shit. They weren't successful, but yeah. yeah right? you, have no, you have no idea, Sal. Yeah. They went right in the toilet, but it's it, all good. It is the shit. Yeah. Next question is from Ali Greenway. Is counting your weekly calories just as effective as tracking your daily caloric intake? Yeah, to an extent, right? If it's extreme, like let's say your <laughs> let's say your total weekly calories is fourteen thousand calories, you eat them all in one day, and the rest of the days you don't eat anything, <laughs> then probably not. Yeah. But here's why I like weekly calories over daily calories: it mimics real life more. So what I mean by that is, 
real life, you don't eat the same exact macros and calories every single day. That's how bodybuilders right. and competitors eat. And it's very monotonous. It's not a great relationship. It's way more neurotic that way too. Totally. You're going to keep tracking every single day. And, and you know, yeah, they, yeah, this does allow for a little bit of spillover and, and, you know, you'd have a little bit more of a high day, a little bit more of a low day. But I mean, you got to be definitely paying attention still. It's going to add up. At the end yeah. Of the I like it better. I like it better. I like having high days and low days. Again, it mimics real life. I can listen to my Hunger cues, my energy. I can read more my body. Flexibility. Yeah, someday. Oh, I'm gonna go. Oh, Saturdays, I like to go out to dinner with my wife. So that's a higher calorie day and whatever. If you do it like that, I think it's better both uh, behaviorally. I also think it's better metabolically. In my experience, I get better results when it's not the same every single day. Well, our our bodies and our metabolism existed before time and days and <laughs> weeks. You know <laughs> yeah, what I'm saying? True. So yeah. I mean, I, it's that's one of the things I always try and get my clients out of like. It, we have we've we've structured our whole lives around these schedules of Monday through Friday, and that these d hours in a day, and like none of that stuff is. It's we made it up, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Before that, we had a metabolism, and we had things, and you still burn calories, right? It didn't, it doesn't know by a clock what, how you are going to burn or not burn. So I do like the idea of paying attention over over a week versus you know being hung up on every single day, every single meal. It's just honestly though, the the, the best answer to this is it's whatever works best for you, whatever one that you will do the most consistently, right? So if you're somebody who will be more consistent with paying attention to these things and actually watching it, tracking it, and you do better by just adding it up at the end of the week and then evaluating how much exercise you did and saying, oh, I'm in a surplus or I'm in a deficit, then by all means do that. If you're somebody who needs to hold yourself accountable on more of a daily basis, then I understand that also. So yeah. you could you could technically stretch this out for a month. You can go months yeah. at a time. You know, it's funny though. That physiologically speaking, they've done studies on bodybuilders have done this forever, but they've done now they have studies to support why bodybuilders have had this kind of experience where they compared people dieting, and one group did the same you know calories deficit consistently, and the other group had a deficit, and then would have like a week or a few days where they'd eat more, and then they go back to a deficit type of deal, uh, kind of like bodybuilders refeed days or whatever. And they found that the people that that increased the calories every so often actually did better. They kept more muscle and burned more body fat. So physiologically speaking, there may be something there. I speak more of the behavioral aspect. I think it's superior for most people behaviorally, and I think that's the most important thing to focus on anyway. Mm -hmm. Next question is from Sebastian Ortiz. How do I train for aesthetics while staying detached from my body image? Oh, yeah. This is a good one. You know, uh, it, it's you can't not do something. So, in other words, you can't say to yourself, don't focus on aesthetics. Like, what does that look like? <laughs> Rather, take your focus and move it to something else. Do that first. And the most effective thing I've seen with clients and even with myself to get them to stop focusing so much on how they look is to focus on their performance. The reason why I like performance is it's objective. So you're either stronger, you're either can do more reps or you can't. It's also, now you can get obsessive in this direction too. However, for the most part, if you're getting stronger, more fit, you're doing a lot of things right, right? You're doing a lot of things right. Uh, you could lose weight and do a lot of things wrong, but getting stronger, more fit, Typically, you're doing things, most things right. So take your focus from aesthetics and focus purely on performance and uh, have some fun with that. And then from there, you can move to detachment. Now, do you not believe that you can be objective and pay attention to watching mm -hmm. yourself build or lose muscle too, though? How, how hard that is for I know, but I mean, I, I the, the reason why I want to bring that up is because I know we talk so much in this, like, always pushing people in this direction of, like, you know, don't focus on aesthetics, focus, focus on performance, yet... When I was competing, I was not focused on performance. I was focused 100% on aesthetics. You're pretty, you're pretty just, advanced, though. I know. I, I know, but I, I, I don't want to make people think that they can't go work in that direction. Like, you you just, you don't have to, uh, you can look at yourself in the mirror and objectively say, I've been working on my shoulders and I can see they are more developed now, yeah. you know? And I, because of the work that I put in, I have grown my shoulders by an extra inch or for every body part mm -hmm. and be objective about it and not identify with, I am small or I am big or I am fat or I am skinny. Like you are not those things, but you can objectively look at your physique and say, I went and I'm following MAPS aesthetic and I picked my shoulders and my calves as my areas of focus and I've been good on my diet and I've been watching and I can objectively say they grew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I yeah, don't- Yeah, that's, it's a, it's a, that's the next, I would say that would be the next step, right? Because when you can get to that point where you can look in the mirror and, and say to yourself, I've been treating my body good, I've been treating my body well, I've been taking care of myself, I can see the physical yeah. you know, reality of that. 
then you're doing great. The problem is uh, everybody identifies with well, most people do with how I was, they look. I was going to say some sort of in between of what you guys had, had mentioned in in terms of of following a very specific program to the T and trusting the process, but maybe not so much being neurotic about like checking in the mirror and and maybe not like incorporating that as a part of it. Just you know going through a really good thought out program that it's not like uh, you're, you're in there trying to guesstimate, uh, you know, and really hyper focus on these body parts as much as you're doing all the work, you're putting in the work and then coming up, you know, in with a checkup, like at the end of the month, and then, you know, starting to kind of bring that side in a little bit more. Yeah. You know, it's funny. The, the irony is right. The people that I've known who more consistently detach from body image are the super obese. Now they don't do it because they're, they're, they're being healthy about it. They do it rather because they're trying. They don't want to see the reality. Yeah, they're avoiding it. They're avoiding it. Yeah. Have you guys ever? I've I've trained so many of course, people. I've, I've had clients that have told me literally that said, "Adam, I haven't looked in a mirror in five years." Yes, I know. I yeah. remember the first time I heard that, it yes. blew my mind. Yeah. Like, I'm like I, wait, a minute, you don't brush your teeth? No, I don't brush my yeah. teeth. I never. I don't have the lights on when I get undressed yeah. or dressed. Yeah. I do it in the dark, and I don't look in the mirror. Yeah. yeah. I heard that, and and I couldn't believe when I heard that, but it makes perfect sense mm-hmm. because I used to think to myself, "How do you become a hundred pounds overweight? Don't you see?" You know, when you're getting there, no, they, they actually detach from it so effectively yeah. that they they've don't even moved it. Yeah. They've completely yeah. removed it. Yeah. So very interesting. Yeah, I, th- I definitely think there's a, a way you can do this and not. It, it, you just have to know that you're potentially playing with fire because most of us are driven to the gym by our insecurities. Yeah. So if you know that and you're aware of that, and then you're obsessing over the way your body is looking or not looking. Then yeah, this this is definitely uh, th- this is a rabbit hole you don't want to go down. But I also think that if you've been lifting for a long time and you're you're focused mainly on health, but you say, hey, you know what? I really want to challenge myself this year, and I'm gonna I want to build a body that mm-hmm. like I you know I I think I can do that. I think I can get abs. I think I can build these shoulders and these arms, and I'm gonna follow this and I'm gonna stay consistent and see what I can do. I think there is nothing wrong with doing that and being very objective about are you doing a good job or not doing doing right. a job. Mm-hmm. Just don't allow yourself to identify with that. That's who I am. I'm either weak or I'm small or I'm big or I'm buff or I'm not. It's just a result of have you been consistent with what you, your plan that you put in place. Next question is from Silverall Training. Did you have any strategies in your personal training business to create efficiency or automation when working with and managing a lot of clients at once? Yeah, this is a good question, and because in some ways automation uh, improves your service and your value, and in other ways, I've seen trainers automate and it reduce Mm -hmm. their their the value that they provide clients so i think it's smart if you want to be a really effective trainer what i mean by effective is you you really change people's lives you really get them to you know create a a lifelong good relationship with exercise and nutrition if that's what you want to do you should automate the business side of what you're doing which is managing their payments managing you know when they're paying their scheduling that kind of stuff but never ma- never automate their training or their nutrition because uh, then you lose the individualization and you lose the on-the-fly ability to manage and change as people's feelings and attitudes and lifestyle type of change. Mm-hmm. I've seen trainers automate everything, yeah. and then it becomes nothing more than just a. Well, I've seen your a couple different strategies. Like you know, in order to be more efficient, a lot of times they'll end up doing um, small groups. They'll they'll stack some of their clients together and try and. But you have to realize, like, you know, just inevitably your, your service is going to go down just a bit because you're not hyper focused on the individual. Like, like now you have a couple people to account for, you know, and it might work uh, for a while, but it just depends on on your business model. Maybe maybe that's part of your business model. Maybe, you know, even group training is something you're trying to lead into. I went the other direction. I went I went in reducing and providing more value. And so, uh, you know, I started looking at the price point that I was putting out, you know, for each client in that became sort of a barrier. So that way I could slow down a bit, provide better service. And then I got a better result for, out of my client because, you know, there's more buy-in and plus my business flourished. So I, I like the way that you, and I'd love you to explain how you did it. I, I love the way you charged your client because the traditional model is clients buy packages of sessions. So like, yeah. you know, 10 sessions for, you know, a thousand dollars or 20 sessions for whatever. But you did it so that they paid you monthly, right? Yeah. They paid, they paid monthly a flat fee. Uh, and basically, you know, I gave them two options. So that way they're either 
part-time or they're full-time. And so this requires them to commit uh, to any of scheduled, you know, days that, that were marked in the calendar that they they show up or they don't show up. I'm going to be there. And if I'm not there, I'm paying them back or I'm like, you know, prorating it or whatever that is. But uh, it, it takes the accountability. It puts it back on the client. And that way too, I can be, I can have consistent revenue each month that, you know, I can account for. So, so part time would be like I pay this much, but and I can come see you two days a week. Full time, right? Is, I pay it's this like much. two to three times per week versus full time was you know I was going up with uh, four so to I five think, times. I think a that's week. really really brilliant. So um, I love this question, um, and there's been like several things in my career that I think I, I got better at as far as my organization and how do I manage so many you know scaling up on how many clients from ten to twenty to thirty plus. Um, the best thing that I ever did, and it took me a long, this wasn't even that long ago. It was just shortly before mind pump started. Did I really get this? And the reason why I was able to do this is because we are now, and this is why I love all the tools and the apps and things like that. Now to Sal's point, I agree fully automating some things like that, that just, they need a personal touch are, are so, are so important. And you may, you know, you may decrease the value in, in your service if you try and automate everything. But what I used to do as a trainer is I used to do all the legwork, the, the tracking, the writing down, the, you know, I was the one doing all that. And I flipped that on its head towards the end of my career where I began holding them responsible to deliver all that information to me. That was a huge game changer for me as far as time suck. It also weeded out the not serious clients. Mm -hmm. If you were not willing to weigh yourself in the morning at night, you were not willing to add, put your food in your in your food app every single night. If you were not willing to track your steps every single day for me, and you log all of that information and then deliver it to me, then you weren't. I wasn't going to train you. If you did all those things, it made my job extremely easy. Then I all I had to do was sit down, assess in a week see where, where her weight has gone up or down and what she exactly ate, look at her food logs. And then we could, in one session, I could critique that entire week. I could educate and teach. I can drive the programming from there. Do I need to increase intensity? Do I need to lower it and modify it? Do I need to increase steps from there? Do I need to bump up her calories? And she had to do all the tracking for me. I didn't do any of it and you bring it to me. And then that allowed me to take on way more people then the old version where I'm writing everything down, I'm measuring everything, I'm weighing and doing all these things. I'm the one who's like writing the diets out and the plans out like, nah, I got away from all that. When we talked on the podcast a long time ago, I talked about how I used to make clients track their food for a week or two before I would even start their, their session. With them. And that was first to get, are you even serious enough to track your food for a week if you're even considering working with me? And a lot of people, honestly, that weeds out like 50%. Yeah. 50% of the people won't even, and I always know they're not that serious. It's like, I'm not even charging you yet, and I can't even get you to write out your food for a week, and you're telling me you really want to learn and you really want to figure this out? Like, no, that client's going to cause, is going to be so much work for me to try and help them if they can't even help themselves for the first week. So that right there really, really helped now me. Now, this, this speaks to the experienced trainer who has a lot of value and has the ability to still have a business while weeding people out, right? Right. Now the new trainer might not have that luxury, that's, right? That's I mean that's that's the thing. That's why a question like this. I like a question like this, but you have to understand there's there's that's why I meant there's yeah, like when you first started, yeah, you, you I, took everybody. I took, I took everybody. Yeah. I took every it didn't matter the time. Then you become more efficient. Didn't matter how inconsistent you were. I need I needed the experience. I needed mm -hmm. to build my book. And that, and and that's a good thing too, right? Like if you're just getting started as a trainer, you don't want to come off as pompous and like, "Oh, I only take the yeah. serious people." Yeah, it's you like, don't know what you're doing anyway. Yeah, you don't know what the fuck you're doing anyways. <laughs> you need practice. You need practice. You need headache. You need all yeah. that bullshit. You know, like Gary Vee says, eat shit for nine years. Yep. Go through all that process for a while. Then when you get that down, then you can start to do things like this where you, like Justin, move to a super high class, people that are spending top that dollar. That did not happen for a while. Yeah, you couldn't yeah. do yeah. that in year one. <laughs> I took everybody for years. Yeah, year and, one, yeah. you can't say, oh, you can only work with me if you have five or seven no. grand budget a month. Like, yeah, get out of here. No, 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 Not a lot of trainers can do that. You got to wait till you figure it out. You get the timing. You, you know all the nuances involved. Involved, uh, and then you you start looking back at what what's going to benefit my business the most. How can I structure that? How can I get buy in from you know potential new new prospects? And 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 then you go from there. Well, I I do believe though, even if you're a new trainer, you can move in the direction that I'm talking about. You just might be a little more 
flexible on still taking somebody, sure. right? So maybe where I'm more of a hard ass, where I'm saying, I'm "Sorry, I'm not even going to take you." Maybe you still take them and try and move and move them along, and you learn from them and they learn from you. Yeah. But you definitely can. St- I mean, we have all these tools now. It's not that expensive to get something that tracks your steps. Mm-hmm. There is My Fitness Pal, Fat Secret apps that are super easy to use. Most everybody has access to like a scale. I mean, we all can text back and forth so easily. So we can now, and this wasn't like this 20 years ago. 20 years ago, we didn't have all this. We, we had binders and files and we had to write everything down. Like a lot of this stuff can be tracked right in your phone and you should you put a lot of the responsibility because here's the deal. Well, they learn from it. Well, they, and they also have to do this the rest of their life. Yeah. If they got to do this the rest of their life, at one point or another, they got to learn to start doing this. Yeah, shit. and what you mean by the rest of your life, by the way, for listeners who are like, oh my God, I have to add my food up every single No, 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 no. You do, for, you do at first to learn what's in food. After a little while though, you can... Tell what's in the chicken breast and right. know where you're getting your carbs. And you can, it's just yeah, to you bring. You have to have a baseline first. Yeah, it's just you're going to school for a little while. That's right? right. Yeah, my strategy was a little bit different towards the end. I, similar though, right? Uh, I still took almost anybody who, who wanted to hire me, but if they weren't consistent, didn't show up, I just took them off the schedule. And I'd tell them that. I'd say, look, here's the deal. You missed two workouts. Um, it seems like it's real tough for you to, to show up right now. So I'm going to take you off the schedule. But you, because I have other people that can put I can put in that time. You let me know when you're ready to come back, and that usually would weed people out, or they would start to show up and be a little more consistent. The reason why that was my strategy was I tried to meet people where they were because I found that I actually found success when I would get the occasional client who didn't want to do anything else but show up once a week. I don't want to do anything else, but I'll show up once a week. And over time, I had a few clients that I did this with. Over time, they came two days a week, three days a week, did it on their own. And then they started to really make those changes. But yeah, if you're showing those signs of whatever, um, obviously, I'm not going to waste my time. And so I just say, well, okay, you know, I used to do that. I text them. Listen, you know, you missed another workout or 20 minutes late. I'm going to take you off the schedule. Uh, you know, let me know. I'm going to put someone else there. You let me know when you're ready to come back. And usually they would come back. Sometimes I'd never hear from them again, in which case, you know, you're weeding them out. Look, if you like this podcast and you like our information, you have to head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our written guides. We have guides on almost everything from building your arms to your butt to burning body fat. Uh, Even for personal trainers, we have guides for personal trainers. All of them found at mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin. Me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Emotional intelligence. You have to be able to understand the filter, the way other people are looking at things. And if you don't understand and comprehend that, you will never, ever speak to the mass audience. You're only going to speak to a selective few. Leadership is the most important element of any 